All right, uh, here we go. <laughs> Anthony uh, J. Sensei, how are you doing today, man? I'm good, man. How about you? Ready to run? It. <laughs> it's been dope so far, you know, being one third of like the Midnight District, you know, I've had like a very dope opportunity to interview also your other partners, uh, Solstice and uh, Pacemaker. And, you know, with the music uh, as well, like with Way of the Sensei, it's a dope project. And Thank even you. with the Slowed and Froda project, it's also dope too. And you know, it seems like a unique story from all three of you, you know. Thank you, man. I appreciate that a lot. Like, definitely. No doubt, no doubt. And, and uh, you know, it's dope to also start off, uh, you know, with this opportunity to talk more about your upbringing. So, you know, growing up in Birmingham, in Birmingham Alabama or Alabama in that sense, uh, was your city like a big place for music in terms of being like an industry city or just as a community back then? I mean, it's more so community. So, you know, back then you had like your different pockets of people. So you had, you know, the rappers over here and then you had the Indian pop bands over here, but now everybody's starting to kind of like meld together in a sense, like, cause I've seen people like the show's getting way more versatile, which is good. So I think we're more community based now, but as Birmingham starts to progress, it's going to become like more mainstream. No doubt, no doubt. And, you know, Alabama, like, it has, like, a lot of, like, dope artists here and there. You know, Young Blue, you have uh, Clever, you have No Cap, Rilo Rodriguez, Big Crit, um, Yellow Wolf, I think. You know, I think he's from uh, Alabama, too. And, like, also, you know, some people in the rock scene, they're dope as well. And, you know, yeah. even discussing more about, like, Alabama in determining like the landscape of the Alabama music scene, uh, please redefine to me what it means to be an artist in Alabama. Man, honestly, I really think it depends on how versatile you are and how different you are. Like in Birmingham specifically, we all we have like distinct sounds. So, and what I mean by that is, like, you have kind of like the hood struggle rap over here, and then, like I said, you have the Indian pop bands that talk about their stuff. So if you're gonna hop into those type of genres the biggest thing you have to do and I tell all artists this is be versatile and set yourself apart from that um me and my uh mentor big profit we always talk about um we compare the Birmingham scene to the Atlanta scene right why are they so different when we only two when we only two hours apart I think it's because mainly it's they have a different mindset over there. They work together. Everybody's trying to eat. Everybody has the same goal and everybody's just working towards the same thing. I think in Birmingham, we have this mindset of, oh, I got to get mines. I don't want you to get yours. I don't, I'm not trying to help you. And I think that's where we all fall at, you know, cause it's enough out here for everybody to eat. That's what I learned. Like, and I don't mind helping people. And I feel like if Birmingham artists get that mindset of, let's all eat instead of I'll just eat and I ain't worried about your plate, then we'll all succeed. That's dope. That's dope. And, you know, it's also interesting uh, to, you know, Alabama right now, it's on a big note right now because a lot of rappers are like popping from there right now. And, you know, the scene to me, in my opinion, it's, you know, pretty dope so far, you know, with yeah, a lot of like, recent, like, yeah. So um, as of like right now, how do you feel about the Alabama like music scene? Uh, do you feel that there should be some changes on the direction of where the music scene should go at the moment? Or you think it's like fine the way it is? Um, I don't think it's necessarily fine the way it is. It's always room for growth. Um, I, and I honestly see it slowly progressing. Um, I think probably within the next five to 10 years, we're going to, uh, I don't, we could potentially be like an um, you just seen like Atlanta, um, since there's a lot of cross pollination between the states. Um, just the southern region in general, the southern region in general, like. But I definitely feel like Alabama's progressing. All I gotta say is just like work, like I said before, just working together. All we're all if we're all working to the same goal, why not help each other instead of just trying to you know step on each other and and get to get there first, so to speak. No doubt, no doubt. And, you know, I just want to get to you more on that basis, too, because this is like your story and everything right now. So um, what was like your musical background in like history and what made you decide on wanting to become like an artist, a singer, songwriter and like a rapper as well? Right. Yeah. So as you come from a musical background, um, my dad was a DJ actually in Memphis, popular DJ. 
Um, my mom was on Broadway when she was with us. She did plays as well. And I'm also, uh, in a, uh, my folks are pastors. So my mom sings in church and my dad's a pastor. They're both singers too. So I always grew up around music. Um, rap wasn't even my, my first genre that I was introduced to. It was gospel, R&B, then rap. So I really started getting to rap around like third grade. I think my first ever rap song was, uh, was Miss Officer by, uh, by Lil Wayne. So, and I think the turning point, and I always like wanted to, you know, I think I always wanted to be an artist. I just didn't really know what that meant up until high school because, you know, back then I would watch 106 in Park. I would see all the music videos and I would watch all the, uh, the hip hop award shows on BET. Like BET played a huge role as far as like me seeing that stuff and actually be like, man, this is cool. I want to do that. Like, um, and I think the defining moment, like the turning point for me, really wanting to be an artist was like in high school. I wasn't really social in high school until like my senior year. So I had a lot of time to like study music, delve into the, the culture, the art by different artists and stuff like that. Um, one project that really changed my perspective on just music in general was uh, Chris Brown's Before the Party. It's a mixtape. It, it was only available on Spring River. Uh, that because I didn't have Apple Music or anything back then because I couldn't I, I just wasn't gonna pay for it so Spring was like the next big thing and that was the wave back in like 2012 to 2016 you know you would hear all the new songs before they they went mainstream um and senior year I actually joined uh show choir so that was my first time actually getting a little bit of stage presence as well and I had never actually sung in front of people as far as that went um except for a couple times in church, but it wasn't really nothing serious. When I, and that's when I was little. So um, I did show choir and another person that actually played a like, key role in, in that time frame back then was my choir teacher, Mr. Kincaid. Like I had no prior like um, training as far as like show choir or acting, anything like that, but he took a chance on me and let me join. You know, I he saw the growth and he saw the potential like, and that, like I just, I, I always think I'm like, even to this day, like he still supports everything I do. No doubt, no doubt. That's pretty dope in that sense too. So you stated like, even like with gospel music and like with Chris Brown and like the hip hop R&B type stuff, like those just like some like genres and like artists that, you know, influenced you in that sense too. Um, Even like if you have like other like um influences, like, you know, with other artists or genres, like tell me more about that. And, um, you know, in the future, uh, who would you like to work with like someday? Yeah, definitely um, Tory Lane. So whenever I pay attention to an artist, I really look at how, you know, um, how versatile they are, because that's that's my main thing. I'm all about versatility putting your hands in different things and it's selling at them. So, you know, um, you know, Chris Brown, for instance, like, you know, he's been in the game for 15 plus years. He's outshined pretty much everybody that was before him. Bro basically has the Midas touch. Anything he has basically just, he's, it's just, he just excels at it. Another person, uh, Tory Lanez, uh, that's the same thing. Great marketer, uh, knows what he's doing as far as like the music industry goes. Uh, Travis Scott, you know, he's a great artist, also has super dope merch that is like, you know, one of the biggest things in hype beats culture as far as, far as that goes. Um, then you have, uh, do you know who Dua Lipa is? Yeah, I know who uh, Dua Lipa yeah. is, yeah. Fire, her last, her last um, project was fire. I had recently just got into her um, during the pandemic, right? So, you know, that gave me a lot of time too to actually, actually explore different artists as well. Um, you know, then you have uh, Two Chains. Uh, I like Two Chains because of his flow and just like where he came from as far as like his background and stuff like that. And, and how he, he didn't really make it until, you know, late in his life, like later in his life, you know, because, you know, different artists, like they don't, they usually make it like, you know, mid twenties, you know, a little bit younger than that. Like he didn't make it to, like he was like almost 30 or something like that. So, you know, anybody would, anybody like that like is definitely a major influence this is a lot more artists but those are just ones that majorly influence my music 
Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And you you did mention about like Tory Lanez and like Chris Brown as well. Um, you know, just speaking more of like a situation like uh, right now. Um, you know, like he's not getting as like much promo like nowadays as well with like that whole situation. Right, Do you right. feel like if you know stuff does change for him like would there be like a possibility of a uh, comeback for Tory Lanez to be I mean, big oh good good my bad it's for him to like be big you know as he was like before in that sense honestly I feel like he's bigger now ever since the situation happened like I really I really do feel that way like honestly he really doesn't even need the promotion because his fan base is so solid and he knows how to market himself as an artist. Like, he took that situation, right? And we don't know what necessarily happened that night or anything like that. It's just between those people. But besides the point, he took that situation and made a dope project out of it and completely switched, like, got to, like, you know, change everybody's perspective on him. Like, because, you know, he basically told his side of the story. And I feel like that was a great way to do it because I feel like if he would have did it anyway and tried to explain his side... Nobody would have heard it, but he put out a great piece of work, great body of work, and it spoke for itself. Like, honestly, I really think this, that uh, Daystar album is like a classic album because that's, it's so real. Like, I listen, I listen to it back to back. It's just, it's real. So, um, honestly, I think his career took off even more after this situation. Like, I don't think he was as, he was as big as he was now in this present moment. Oh, true, true. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, speaking, you know, more about your new, your latest project, uh, Wave the Sensei. Um, yeah. So, uh, tell me like more about that, and what's like the creative uh, process and inspiration of that project as well. Yeah, man. So, um, Wave the Sensei. What I always had that name in mind. I just thought it sounded cool. Um, I when I really think of song titles or anything like that, I don't put a lot of thought into the song title is really just, you know, spur the moment type thing and whatever sticks and whatever sounds good in my head, is, that's what I usually put. So where the sensei, I'm big on alliteration. So alliteration, Anthony J. Sensei, that's an alliteration. So anything like that, um, as far as the project went, the two main things I wanted that project to uh, show was my versatility and um, how serious I was as an artist. And I think it did both of those things since it was my first project coming out. Um, I got a lot of positive reviews on it, so that was that was pretty good as well. Um, man, like, and uh, the, the process behind it, like, a lot of people don't know, like, I was working at the post office, like, the warehouse, right? So this was in the middle of the pandemic. Um, a lot more busy. We're getting a lot more mail, and I'm working 10 to 12 hours, seven, almost seven days a week, um, going to the studio right before work mixing mastering all my stuff recording all my stuff then going straight to work not getting off until um you know seven in the morning because i go into work at 10 so very very taxing like very i was super tired um and then i you know i ran in front of the snags like as far as like money issues trying to you know put it out the right way and not just you know halfway put it out because i wasn't going to do that um and I, I mean honestly i at one point in time, I just gave up on the project. I was like, maybe this isn't the right time to put it out because I don't have all the resources I need. But then, you know, I have a good thing. The good thing about it is I have a good support system in my friends, sources and pacemaker and just the people around me that supported me and was like, bro, just keep doing what you're doing. Put it out when you need when you think it needs to be put out. And, um, you know, it got finished and I'm glad I, I stuck with it because I think if I would have waited, it would have lost its touch in a sense true true and you know what's also interesting too um you know like solstice like in that sense too you know you released you know a different version of the project you know which is like a slowed and throat version um yeah so tell me like more about that like in that sense too um like what inspired you to create like that specific version uh, for like wave sensei yeah so um i was never really on a slowed and throw away for real like solstice is the one that really put me in uh and pace on that um he yeah because he we would play it at different like um kickbacks and stuff like that and he would play it at the crib and we were just chilling so he actually had the idea was like man i'm gonna put um i'm gonna make my ep's called and throw 
he was like, I think we should all do the same thing. He was like, one, no, no artist is doing that because whenever you see Sword and Throw stuff, it's only on YouTube, right? We were the ones that put it out on all platforms. And um, so I was like, that's a dope idea because I honestly think it brought new life to the projects and it, it, it made a whole nother side that you didn't really see to the projects. And some of our most popular songs are the Sword and Throw versions of our EP, on the EPs. So I really think that was a good marketing tool as far as that went. And it just made more content and made us, you know, uh, more versatile in that sense. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. You know, like nowadays too, uh, you really don't see like a lot of like Stone Throat or like Chopped and Screwed type right, right. projects anymore because, you know, that was like sort of like a big thing, you know, especially like in Houston and other parts of the South, like, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s so would you consider that like as like an ode in that sense to you know like with down south culture um or would it be sort of like something new that you know you guys are taking it taking it on as you know um i definitely think it the culture has been around but i think it, we're just adding new life to it in a sense um i think it's i think it's one of those things that um you know, it's kind of, it's, it's community out there for it, but it's not mainstream. So nobody's really paying attention to it. Uh, so I think what we're doing as far as like adding it to uh, the hip hop culture, like a little bit more and trying to put it out there a little bit more is going to shed new light on it. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And, you know, to also speak more about, you know, the whole like midnight district thing. Um, so tell me, so, you know, being in that midnight district group, uh, you know, tell me like your side of the history of the group and like how it was formed. Yeah, so me, Souls and Pace were already working together. Um, you know, as far as that goes, uh, we had we were already we were, I think it was in the midst of us working on our EPs and uh Solstice put in the group chat that we're all and he was like, Hey, um, we were we've been working together for a minute. I think we should come up with a name for ourselves. And I was like, Okay. I was like, I was like, let me see. I was like, let me see how this goes. So, uh, we've thrown back and forth names. Um, one thing we was trying, like, with the name, we were trying to make it memorable, and we didn't. We wanted to set ourselves apart from anybody else in Birmingham. So, because a lot of the uh, groups and you know rap groups and stuff like that all have a similar take on their names. So that was our main goal on that, and we finally decided. Uh, to come up with Midnight District. I think we debated on it for like a week or so and we decided to come up with Midnight District, right? So um, at first, it, I think it was just a cool name, but as we started to brand ourselves, like with our merch and, uh, you know, putting ourselves out there as Midnight District, as an artist collective, um, I really think that it's starting to hold more meaning and that we're figuring that out day by day as we as we promote ourselves as Midnight District. So, um, yeah, that, yeah. And I'm interested to see where we go with this as far as, cause I don't even know at this point, like I think we're just taking it step by step cause this is something new for all of us. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, and also, you know, your name is also like sort of like unique in the way where, like when I read like, you know, Anthony, like Jay Sensei, um, you know, it has like a different like tone to it. Um, and, you know, just with the styling of the name and everything like that. So tell me more about like how you got the name uh, Anthony J. Sensei. Yeah. So um, my name. So my full name is Charles Anthony Jones. Right. So I just use Anthony and then the first letter of my last name. Right. So originally when I put on my first song um, back in 2017, I had um. I, it was originally just Anthony J, right? I, the sensei wasn't even in the picture yet. But I was like, man, that sounds too R&B. And I was like, I'm not an R&B artist. I'm an artist. So I need a name that's going to fit well across all genres. So I was like, let me think of something else. So I was on Instagram one day. And um, Quavo's Instagram popped up, right? So his Instagram name is Quavo Hunter. It, alliteration, right? So I uh, looked at the name and I was like, okay, that's kind of fire. I was like, let me see if I can find some, like a word or something that I could do the same thing with my name and just add it to the end of my name. So 
I'm looking through it and Sensei pops up. It was like a perfect storm because I'm huge on Japanese culture and everything like that. And then it, I don't know, it just, it just flowed right together. I'm not, I, it wasn't like I planned for it to happen. It just sort of happened that way. So it's almost like it was kind of like destiny meant to be. No doubt, no doubt. And you know, it's crazy too. You know, sensei, it's actually like a Japanese word, which also means like teacher. Right. So like, even in that sense too, uh, do you like consider yourself like a teacher, like in terms of the whole music style, you know, just with what you guys like bring to the t- uh, table and like what you're bringing on to like others as well? Yeah. Um. Yeah. And also too, like I've been told I get really good advice. So that was another re- reason if really fit my name as well. Um, but yeah, I definitely think in the Birmingham area, like we're, sh- we're, we're bringing something new to the table as not just me, but as like midnight district and stuff like that. Like, and I feel like the sensei kind of like just mails together all that. No doubt, no doubt. And, you know, like right now, like we're living like in a different time, like right now, you know, with the whole like pandemic, you, you know, situation. And, right, right, right. you know, like even like since the pandemic like started, do you feel that it has affected the way that you tend to proceed with your business? And, you know, since then, like what were some changes or tweaks that you had to hand do to handle your business? Like I know you spoke more on it, like in the way of the sensei situation, uh, but right. like with other stuff too, do you ha- have you ever had to like change certain things during that time? Um. Yeah, so, I mean, actually, like, when we were first starting, you know, and I think this is how everybody was, but when we were first starting, most of our interactions with our fans and with our personal clients and uh, networking clients were, you know, all mostly face-to-face since we were, like, networking in the city. So now, you know, the pandemic happens, we're locked down. We have this tool, Instagram, which is basically the best networking tool out there right now. So... What we all decided to do was build up, build up our online presence, which we were already currently doing at the time. We just weren't putting as much emphasis on it because, you know, we could get out and do what we need to do. If we need to go meet somebody, we're going to go meet somebody. So, um, yeah, we definitely, like, we built up our online presence. Um, want, and we wanted to still interact with our fans, but just in a different way. So, I, you know, me personally, I would... Instagram call some of my people, like my fans and stuff like that. Go on live with them, you know, um, anything to still keep that personal relationship with my fans since you can't per- like see each other face to face. So I think that was one way we uh, we actually changed. And that, that was pretty much the only way re- we really uh, maneuvered um, as far as like the pandemic happening, was just like beefing up our online presence yeah no doubt no doubt and you know like right now with the pandemic like it has changed a lot with like a lot of artists too nowadays you know with rappers and artists doing going into different like avenues you know like where now they're doing like club performances now but before you know they were doing like versus battles and mm-hmm. you know ig tv type stuff right, you know, right, like, right, what right. fat joe's doing you know, in-home cooking sessions, you know, all that type of stuff. And, like, crazy to say uh, only fans, uh, but uh, in terms of, like, other, like, artists and other rappers, too, um, do you feel that the pandemic has affected the way that these artists, like, handle their business as well in that sense? Um, Yeah, in a sense. It, like I said, it really, it really just depends on the artist. Like, if I feel like if, if you're if you're an art, like, if you know what you're doing and you're an artist, you'll, you'll figure out a way to, to maneuver around certain situations like this. Like, um, you know, a big thing that's been happening too, like, you know, with uh, different concerts like Rolling Loud, you know, they, they had the virtual concerts now, like, where you can still buy the ticket and still do all this stuff. And they, um, the artists, when they're performing, they show you on the screen and everything like that. So that that's another thing. Virtual concerts have been another big thing. Instagram Live, like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Tory Lanez Lives. But yeah. Very, um, very, quarantine very radio. So quarantine yeah. radio was very entertaining during uh, during uh, the pandemic. That's I would watch that all the time. It's very entertaining. So I, I think he, uh, I think he utilized that tool very well. Um, it's another thing, man. It's 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 so much stuff, but I think really just using 
the internet and you know utilizing Instagram and that presence just uh, I think that's that was the best way to maneuver during the pandemic and now that we're starting to open back up and everything like that like I don't know if you heard but uh Cal is supposed to be opening back up they're supposed to be doing live shows which is good too so um I, yeah I definitely think like just that online presence was just the biggest thing yeah no doubt and you know like just to add like my two cents with the whole situation um i do feel like in some cases too it works for certain people and for some stuff it doesn't work i know i think with california the main reason was that they've had like a low amount of cases you know since their outbreak so they had to like kind of measure it um i know like right now for me uh you know in toronto or like in ontario like right now we're, we're at our third like lockdown shutdown so oh, man. He, he really can do as much uh in that okay. sense i mean we had like a couple of stuff like opening back up but uh mm-hmm. you know with, we had like some rising numbers here and there too but even in that sense too i think you know in my opinion you know i do feel like that this new model that they're doing should work for at mm-hmm. least a year or two um I do feel like, you know, with indoor concerts, they should, like, I think for the majority, like, even festivals, you know, you might not see it maybe within, like, the end of, like, next year or, like, the right. beginning in two years. So, you know, hopefully for the best, too. But, you know, I'm glad that, like, we're with other states and other places, you know, they're handling it, like, much better. And hopefully, right, you know, right. for the best for people to perform, you know? Oh, yeah, definitely, man, because I, I know I'm ready. So I've been ready. So, no doubt, no doubt. You know, we're just about to end off this interview. So, um, tell me. So, uh, what are your plans? You know, for twenty twenty one, in terms of like new music, everything else going on and such. And you know, I usually say this to everyone that I have on my platform. Um, do you have any final words you would like to say for any creative or any person pursuing their dreams? Yeah, man. So, man. So, I. Oh, I the summertime is gonna go crazy. That's all I can say. We got some, we got some bangers for y'all. Um, then I'm gonna do something special like fall, winter time. But you know, just anything I want to say to any upcoming artist or anything like that. Know why you do music because that's what's gonna get you um, through the tough times of like when nothing's going right and stuff like that. You have to know what's the reason I'm making music? And it can't just be for the fame and money because once you get that, then what? Like you've achieved everything at that point. It's like, then what? Um, another thing too, I would say, find you solid people. You don't need a whole lot of people following you. You don't need an honorage. Find you some, like two or three solid people and then just work towards their goal. Make sure y'all are on the same page. Make sure y'all are grinding, you know, um, have the same mindset as far as where y'all want to go. Uh, and another thing, like, just don't overthink um, what you're trying to do. Because I have I, I have to tell myself that constantly, too, because I overthink a lot of stuff. Like, um, but I think it's all it's all just for the love of the craft at the end of the day. Like, so those would be the three things I would definitely uh, tell any upcoming artist or any artist in general that's uh, wanting that's wanting to achieve this. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt.